Good, mor- good morning. To, uh, welcome to Olivet Baptist Church on this Memorial Day weekend. And we certainly do appreciate each one of you being here. I'm sure we have a lot of people out of town as well because it is a holiday. But we're certainly glad that you are here this morning. I think I'll just take the moment again just to ask who we have here this morning that has served in the military. If you'd go ahead and stand, uh, we'd like to recognize you this morning. Appreciate each one who has served in the military, and we're grateful for that. Uh, Appreciate that. Thank you so very much for your service. We realize that we're all actually soldiers. Right? Uh, We may not be soldiers in the U.S. Army or the U.S. Navy or some branch of the military, but we are all in the battle, and so therefore we're all soldiers, and we're going to be singing about some of those fights this morning as we sing. Start with number 657. Stand with me. All get to stand now because you're all soldiers in this army. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. We'll sing stanzas 1, 3, and 4, number 657. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished. And Christ is Lord indeed. Stanza three. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel. standing for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just rejoice so much in that personal relationship that we have with with the creator of the ends of the earth, the sovereign of the universe, to know that we have a relationship with you, that we're saved and we belong to you and spend eternity with you. We thank you for the privilege we have of serving you here in this world. And I just pray, dear Lord, that we'll be faithful in all that we do to honor and glorify you. We do thank you for our country. We thank you for the freedom that we have even to assemble this morning uh, as we do. And I, I just pray, dear Lord, that you'll protect our country, uh, be with those in leadership over us even right now. And, of course, all of those that have served you faithfully down through the years to give us the liberty that we have and those that are in the military even right now. Bless them and protect them. I just pray, dear Lord, you'll use us all to honor and glorify you in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Number 663 is O Church Arise and Put Your Armor On. Like I say, we are in a battle. We all have a battle to be fighting. We're going to sing stanzas 1, 2, and 4 of O Church Arise. God has given 
stanza four. So spirit come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. Says saints of old, still line the way, retelling triumphs of His grace. We hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. Over to 660 Onward Christian Soldiers. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe, forward into battle. Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine. One in charity, onward Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Onward then ye people, join our happy the first time or somebody sitting with you, family, hadn't been here in a long time, except for Ashley, she's been here before. <laughs> they said not to introduce her, yeah, all right, anybody else? All right, okay, we're glad to have you here this morning. It makes it a very special day on this Memorial Day weekend, and of course we do salute all of those that have served faithfully in protecting our country, as well as our first responders. We certainly want to thank them very much. Uh, police and fire and, and uh, ambulance and all of those appreciate it very much. Uh, Ashley Steinmack, why don't you come on up here first. Uh, Ashley is going to be working all summer long down at Amazing Grace Baptist Camp and we're going to talk about the picnic tomorrow but give us a personal testimony. All right, so God has opened the door for a big opportunity for me this summer. Um, I'm going to be a counselor at AGBC this summer. Um, I'll be there for about 10 weeks. Um, uh, I'll be one of the girl counselors out of the five of us that will be there. Um, so it's going to be a big summer, hopefully. I'm um, just asking that you guys pray for the camp this summer, that we have a big turnout, and also just for me, as this is my first year um, serving at the camp. Uh, it's been a big part of my life since I was younger, and you know, it's my opportunity to actually serve while I'm down there. Um, I will be leaving right after the service sometime uh, today, and I'll be 
gone for those 10 weeks. Um, so if you feel led to uh, support me in any way, um, you can just uh, leave it in the offering plate and I'll get it after um, the end of the summer or also the camp will hold it for me if you just put it in my name and it'll be there that summer. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Appreciate that. And uh, now, as far as the sponsorship thing, when these young people go to camp and they dedicate their entire summer, they don't get paid. So going off to college next fall and all the things they need to do, and so they forego that opportunity during the summer then to, to earn the money that they're going to need. So the sponsorship type thing is when, uh, as an individual, we can stand behind them and want to encourage them, and if you send money in her name to the camp or just here in the offering or however you want to do it, then it will go to her to help supplement then uh, the idea of her giving the full time down at camp. So thank you, Ashley, appreciate that. Uh, Brother Tevin Camp, why don't you come on up now at this time, David. Uh, not a stranger to us here. Of course, you know his parents and the family, and they're here from every once in a while. But I thought it'd be a good opportunity. He's on vacation. If I'd known he was coming ahead of time, I'd had him preach. He's a great preacher. I love to hear him preach. But just give us an update about the work there. And I just put on the bulletin board just a little, it's from Baptist Bend Missions, uh, the work that they're doing with the, the college ministry. And so you want to read that. It's on the bulletin as you leave. Just take a look at it about what God's doing there at Creston. Well, uh, Pastor did say that he would have me preach, but I stealthily got in underneath the radar on that one. So, um, but uh, we often take mom and dad away from you guys and have them come up to Creston and uh, visit us up there. So we just decided that this time we'd come down and visit them down here. And so uh, our youth pastor is preaching this weekend and church is doing uh, fine there. Uh, yeah, if you want to look at the article, I didn't even know when they were going to publish it. Pastor asked me about it after Sunday school today and I was like, I remember the interview vaguely, but anyway, so he took me back and showed it to me. So it, it's, it's there. We had some neat things happen in our college ministry this last year. Uh, that was really uh, God's, God's glory and being seen in that. And so we're hoping to continue some of those things in the next fall and uh, looking forward to that opportunity. And just thankful again for, for just God's blessing. And um, am I thankful again also for uh, uh, Olivet Baptist Church and the opportunity uh, I had to grow up here and uh, just the, all the memories and all the people that are sitting right here in this room who either I've connected with by way of ministry or you've had a part in putting into my life. And I just want to th say thank you again. Um, we just are trying to remain faithful and do what God wants us to do. And, and uh, we're leaving the results with him. And, uh, and there's been some challenges, but there's also been some really uh, neat things that have happened here over the last couple, uh, over the last year. We had a 73-year-old a lady uh, come to church with her husband. If I showed you their picture, his, uh, he looks just like Santa Claus. I mean, he, he does. His name is, uh, is Jay Nichols, and his wife's name is Karen. And Karen came to our membership class, and Karen was working for a lady in our church who runs an insurance business who was, who was actually um, diagnosed with cancer and was really struggling through the tail end of cancer. And, uh, and Ruth Long ended up leading Karen Nichols to Christ. And, uh, and, um, and uh, Ruth Long had said, I want to see you get baptized. And Karen's like, oh, no, 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 I'm, a, I'm, I'm deathly afraid of water. I don't, I don't do the water thing. <laughs> and, um, and Ruth went on to glory, and uh, that was a, a, just a great thing that God blessed in in that. And Karen came to me and said, you know what, Pastor? Um, I think I need to be baptized. And, uh, and just a few months ago, it was actually back toward, I guess, the, back in February. It was a little bit more than a few months ago, but it was back in February that we had a chance to baptize Karen, 73-year-old lady who had come to Christ and who was deathly afraid of water. My wife got into, although I didn't baptize my wife, I just, <laughs> my wife got in the tank too so she could just be there for, for Karen. And just tell you how full circle all this, all this comes together. We just, um, my daughter cleans for Karen right now. And, um, and Karen had comes faithfully, and just a couple weeks ago, her husband Jay came to me and said, you know what, we need to talk about me becoming a member of the church. And God's working in his life too. And uh, I think he caught my dad's ear at my daughter's graduation reception and talked to my dad into trying to cook with iron skillets. So if you hear anything from that, that's, that's where that came from. And, uh, and we're just thankful for God's blessing in that. We're, we're moving through a stage of parenting where Anna has graduated from high school. She's on her way to Faith Baptist Bible College next year, going to pursue missions until God closes that door. 
And, um, and Luke has graduated from eighth grade. We didn't do that here at Shawnee Mission Christian School. It was just like, you go on, you know, and it's just like, but he graduated from eighth grade. So we have two freshmen now, a freshman in high school and a freshman in college. And so, um, uh, but God's been good in that. I just want to say thank you again to Pastor and Olivet Baptist Church and, and um, all who had an impact into my life. I, I appreciate every single one of you. And, um, and, and a part of what God is using me to do right now uh, comes back as fruit for your labors and not giving up on the squirrely junior high boys like Curtis and I um, when, uh, when we were running all around the place and, and, uh, and just keeping in our, your eyes on us and, and keep pouring into us. We're grateful for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. We appreciate the ministry up there in Creston, and we've got a lot of folk here that have had that interconnection, and uh, that's been pretty neat, uh, you know, Barnett's and others that have been here. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow is what day? And so what's special about, well, there's a lot of things special about Memorial Day, but what's in the bulletin about Memorial Day? A picnic, right? Amazing Grace Baptist Camp. Brother Harry Jonikin, why don't you come and share with us about another picnic that's coming? Uh, and that's our church picnic. So we've got two of them on the calendar, one tomorrow, and the other one is just, what, a week and a half away, isn't it? A week from Saturday? Oh. Huh? Yes, Barry. All right. Close. I'm running out of ammunition when it comes to these poems. <laughs> I may have mentioned this before, but my structure on my poems is that there are eight stanzas, unless for some reason I need to go more, very rarely less. So I've written a lot of stanzas about Sunday school picnics. <laughs> Today is the final Sunday in the merry month of May. Although it has been awfully hot, June 9th will be okay. The crowd may be a little thin. We've got some competition, but we will have a lovely time of keeping our tradition. We will sorely miss the folks unable to attend but you can help to fill the gaps, invite an extra friend. We'll get the weenies grilling, some sausages and brats. You'll bring the salads and desserts of food. There will be lots. 11.30 is the time that we will join to dine. Show up a little early for fellowship divine. I need another line or two, though you may cry enough. Think that I have covered the most important stuff. You don't need directions, you've all been there before. Some time along the creek bank will make your spirit soar. Only 13 days away, not too long to remember. You'll have a happy memory for winter's cold December. We always enjoy the poems. And it, it sinks it in your mind, so you remember the, uh, the picnic here, the church picnic. Now, this particular week, it's still a busy week. I thought once school was out, things would really slow down, but it's a busy week all the way through. Of course, tomorrow being the Memorial Day picnic, then Tuesday, ladies, there's both the afternoon uh, uh, time together, the crochet time, as well as the Bible study in the evening here at church. Wednesday, the normal activities that are going on there. However, Brother Edmondson, what time do you guys leave on Wednesday? In the morning. In the evening, 8.05 p.m., all right. So uh, we want to keep the seniors and the Edmondsons in our prayers. They fly out to San Diego for the senior trip and all the activities. they got lots of things planned. You keep them in prayer and safety as they fly out then. And then, of course, a week from Saturday is the... Uh, uh, the special recognition here, appreciation for our first responders, and we've been talking about that quite a bit. Uh, what we're going to do from 11 until 2 in the afternoon uh, on uh, June the 2nd is that we're going to, we've already invited police, fire, first responders, uh, paramedics, all of the, the people that work in the area uh, in the three cities of Westwood, uh, Fairway, and Roland Park. And uh, so they're all going to, most of them will be here uh, during that time, just as appreciation. It's a cookout. Now, if, uh, if you can help with that, I don't, I don't know if John Tilson's contacted you on already or not. If not, contact him. For the food, there's a sign-up out in the foyer. Make sure you look at that. Sign up for what you can bring during that time and uh, help us as we uh, just provide a little extra thanks uh, to those that serve us. That's this coming Saturday. And then May 31st through June 2nd, 
That's a week from Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Or this Thursday, Friday, Saturday uh, is the uh, garage sale, and make sure that you're aware of that. Um, and uh, I think if you can contribute, you probably already have, but if you can, that would help. Just see Marlena Zink. Appreciate that very much. Okay, lots of other announcements here, things that need to, uh, to be promoted. VBS coming up, can you imagine? Just a couple of weeks here. And uh, you can register online already. So uh, get online, register for VBS. It's coming up June the 11th through the 15th. And um, if you want to help in this at all, see Pastor Micah. I know he'd be very happy to, to take all the helpers that he can get. Uh, VBS is always a very, very busy time. Special congratulations. Andy Reyes, where are you seated? Where's Andy? Is they're taking care of kids? Oh, he had to leave. All right, he got a call and had to leave. We missed him last week when we recognized all of those that graduated. He just graduated his master's from Detroit. He flew up there and walked and uh, finishing up some of the papers. So congratulations then to Andy Ray. It's going to ask the men if they come forward at this time uh, for the morning offering. It's such a joy to know that God's in charge, isn't it? You know, we don't have much, but when we give, God takes it, multiplies it, uses it in a wonderful way for his honor and his glory. And it's a privilege to be able to have a small part into his, his service. So let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we just pray that you'll bless in a wonderful way. And the little that we give, I pray to you, Lord, you'll just take it, multiply it, keep it in, in your service. Use it over and over again to minister to so many different people. We thank you for our missionaries and the support for them. I just pray that you'll bless this offering now. In Jesus' name, amen. What a wonderful truth to know I am his and he is mine. Appreciate that so much. Just a reminder, some of you received a little piece of paper like this last week from me. We're trying to work on getting some summer ensembles planned. I really need that information back from you as soon as possible, if you would please, so we can get things organized for that. Give you one more opportunity to sing as well. Isn't it nice to know that as, as soldiers, we already know ahead of time that we're on the winning side. 
Uh, it's great. It's not because we're such good soldiers. It's because we have Christ as our leader. And so I invite you to stand as we, as we sing number 521, Faith is the Victory. So we are on the winning side. We know that. We'll sing all three stanzas, 521. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith. banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall bow, his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the on the winning side. Be sure to greet two or three people as the choir's dismissed and as the children go downstairs for Children's Church. Good morning. Our scripture today is in 1 Peter chapter 1. And I can't find my glasses, so I guess I'm going to go without my glasses. They're on my person somewhere, but I can do this. Anyway, God bless each and every one of you. And 1 Peter chapter 1 will start with verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the, the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning your, yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of person judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. 
For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. that and uh, that special connection once again with uh, with Creston there the Barnett's all right thank you so very much appreciate that song he will hold me fast take your Bibles please our scriptures and turn with me now to 2nd Corinthians we continue our study here 2nd Corinthians chapter 10 
2 Corinthians chapter 10. The context for our message this morning really begins in verse 2. I know it's listed as starting at verse 3, but we need to go back into verse 2 and kind of get the context for what we're talking about. Paul said there, he said, But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence. Now what he's saying is, he's, he's letting them know there's been trouble. People have, uh, have come into the church now, these false teachers. Uh, they've tried to turn them against the Apostle Paul, against his authority as an apostle. And he says, I don't want that when I come to see you. I don't want to have to be bold. I want to come and enjoy the relationship that we have. But then he continues there with this confidence. He says, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now you read that and you say, well, is that such a big ordeal? Oh, yeah. Yeah, these accusers are saying that the Apostle Paul is doing everything he does in the flesh, in his own self, that he's not the Apostle of God. He doesn't come to them with the power of God. He doesn't speak with the authority of God. His writings, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, man, you just might as well throw those out the window. I mean, that's really a pretty big thing. It doesn't sound much to some of us when he says, well, Paul was accused of walking in the flesh. Well, we need to find out what it means to walk in the flesh and to war in the flesh. So let's bow in a word of prayer and ask God to bless us now as we study this passage of Scripture. Our Heavenly Father, I just thank you so very much that you've given us your word. And Lord, we need to study it diligently. We need to understand what these words mean. And I pray that this morning as we go through the technical part of understanding this passage, that this will not just be an exercise in, in an education but that we'll come to that place of realizing that we cannot walk in the flesh and, and that we need to depend upon you. And this battle that we're in is the application that we're going to make of these scriptures today. And so I pray to you, Lord, you'll just apply all that we're reading here today to our hearts and our lives, that we might be the people you want us to be, that we might be victorious in our Christian life. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This whole idea of walking in the flesh. Now, what does the word flesh mean? It's one of those words in scripture, the Greek sarks. It's, it's a word that just is so broad. Many times it simply means meat. You know, we eat flesh, we eat meat. And so many times that word flesh means meat. It also means our physical body. You know, we are in the flesh. We, we, this is our physical body. Many times it's used as the natural world. The things that just everybody does, that's what everybody, Christian, non-Christian, doesn't make any difference. Uh, they're in the flesh. Many times it is used of the old sinful nature. Now, a Christian is a new creature in Christ. A, a Christian is someone that's been born again. They have a new nature. The Spirit of God comes into their heart and life, and they have that new nature. They also have the old nature. And many times in Scripture, the word flesh describes that old nature, the old man. Also, <coughs> excuse me, as far as Christians are concerned, if we uh, operate in the flesh, it means that we are worldly. We're just, we're Christians, but we're operating like everybody else does. We're thinking worldly thoughts. And so this word flesh is a very broad word. But when you realize they're accusing the Apostle Paul of, of uh, walking in the flesh, they're saying he's just operating like any other person. He is not an apostle. He has no authority. You don't need to pay any attention to him. And what the false teachers are saying is, hey, listen to us. You know, we, we've, we're really spiritual. Paul, no, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's a nobody. You need to forget him. I know he was here years ago, but let's forget him. You listen to us. And so Paul took that very, very seriously. They're undermining the authority of the Word of God. I mean, he wrote much of the New Testament. And they're, they're undermining that authority that he had as an apostle. So verse 3, he responds this way. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, he says, Though we walk in the flesh... Folks, all of us walk in the flesh because we are in the flesh. We live in a natural body and we live in a natural world and we're facing the problems that everybody else faces. When we have physical sickness, hey, our neighbors have physical sickness. Uh, when our business is struggling for some reason or another, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's sinful. I mean, hey, downturn in the economy, whatever it may, might be, 
Uh, you know, our house could burn down just like anybody else's. We live in the natural world. We walk in the flesh. That's the world we live in. That's not a, a strange thing. Uh, we're continually being bombarded by the world's propaganda to think this way, to do that, to turn us away from, from serving the Lord. And so the idea of walking in the flesh is that we're just in this old world. But in contrast there in verse 3, we do not war after the flesh. The fact that we're in the flesh means we've got a battle on our hands. The fact that we're a Christian means that we're at war. Now, we're at war on a lot of levels. And we'll talk a little bit about Satan and, 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 and all of that. But basically, that battle is with the flesh itself. Look at 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, if you would, please. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. The Apostle Paul talks about this battle that we're in. And he says this, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts. Be careful of those old nature desires. The word lust is just the word for desire. All of those desires were in a battle. And as Christians, we've got to be careful about that. He says, which war against the soul. That battle is a very real battle. Every single Christian is in a battle. None of us are excluded. If we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to serve him. We have that new nature. But the old nature is wanting to, to do battle with us. Back in our text again in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, there in verse 3. He makes it very plain. We do not war after the flesh. Now, you see, we walk in the flesh. That's where we live. But we do not war. Our spiritual warfare is not after the flesh. Now, that little word after is identical to the word in verse 2, according to the flesh, at the end of verse 2. And so, if we walk according to the flesh, that means the flesh is dominating our thinking. We're impressed with all the worldly things. We want and desire the things that the world has. We covet the things that everybody else has. If we walk after the flesh or according to the flesh, then the flesh is really leading us in our thinking, our desires. We sit and think, well, do I want to, uh, you know, hey, do I want to go to church tonight or do I want to stay home and do this? Well, we've got a battle. We've got a battle on our hands. A lot of times... We don't even realize the battle that we're in because we're so influenced by the world that's around us. Now, the world and our spiritual nature are at odds. The flesh, the flesh is that old nature. It's always going to be contrary to the new nature. Galatians chapter 5 points this out. Galatians chapter 5, and I want to begin there at verse 16. He says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, the two are contrary. And so how do we battle with the flesh? Well, we walk by the Spirit. Verse 17 says, For the flesh lusteth, that's the old English for desire, the flesh desires to conquer the Spirit. And the Spirit is against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. There's always a battle. Folks, I'm not immune from that battle. You're not immune from that battle. We're always making choices based on the desires of the flesh versus the desires of the spirit. That's that world we live in. That's that battle that we're always up against. In uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, the apostle said, the apostle Paul talked about our relationship with Christ and how we belong to him. And he says there that we have no confidence in the flesh. The flesh is not our friend. Oh, sometimes it feels good to give into the flesh, but that's not our friend, that's our enemy. We have to battle that old nature, the, the flesh itself. We have to depend upon the Lord. John 15 and verse 5, where the Lord talked about abiding in him and he abiding in us. And at the end of verse 5, he said, for without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. Our spiritual battle is totally dependent upon our trust and dependence upon the Lord. We can't battle Satan in our own flesh. We cannot battle the flesh with the flesh. Remember how Jesus talked about, you know, Satan's not going to cast out Satan when they accused him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. It just doesn't work that way. 
We cannot fight the battle of the flesh in the flesh, nor can we serve Christ in the flesh. Back in 2 Corinthians again, chapter 1 this time, chapter 1, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 12. Paul says, For our rejoicing is this, that the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom. Talking about our service for Christ. You know, in simplicity, godly sincerity, but not with fleshly wisdom. But by the grace of God, we have had our conversation, our manner of life in this world, and more abundantly to you, word. And so we have no confidence in the flesh to defeat the flesh, and we have no, no confidence that in the flesh we can serve Christ. Because it's just contrary. He wants us to depend upon him. Those that try to serve Christ in the flesh are called carnal. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I want to read now the first four verses. And I want you just to think with me of what we're reading about. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, those who are spiritually minded, those who are in tune with the things of the Spirit, but as unto carnal, as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. Yeah, they're Christians, but where's their mind? They're not spiritually minded, they're fleshly. Now, the word carnal is just another King James translation of the word flesh. Carnal and flesh are the exact same words and some different translations may, may bring that out. But he talks about these carnal Christians. Well, they're, they're worldly minded. Their mind is like everybody else's, the things that they want. And Paul says, I can't speak to you as spiritual. Verse 2, he says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hereto you are unable to bear it, neither are you now able. They, they haven't grown as a Christian. Verse 3, for you are yet carnal. You're fleshly. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? And if you're a man, you say, well, I am a man. No, no, no. As natural man. You're walking just like everybody else does. You're living your life according to the principles of this world and your old flesh. You're doing things just like you did before you were saved. And you're carnal, he says. And this division, this envy, and all of that, verse 4, he continues. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? You're operating in the flesh. Now, back in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, Paul says, For we walk in the flesh, but we do not war after the flesh. Many of us walk in the flesh, and we live after the flesh. Whether it's our spiritual battle, we lose all the time, or our service for Christ, we're doing it all in our own strength, and we are carnal. Now, he picks up that word carnal in verse 4, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Same word as flesh or fleshly. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That word carnal there, that word flesh, implies the spiritual weakness. If we try to fight Satan in our own strength, we try to fight our old habits in our own strength, we're going to fail. We're too weak. We cannot do that. If we're going to serve Christ in our own strength, oh, it may look good for a while on the outside, but without Christ as the heart of everything that we do, it doesn't amount to anything. And so the weakness of the flesh in contrast now with the, the strength that we have in Christ. So there in verse 4, he says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God has given us that strength and that ability, that might, that power to do what he wants us to do, to live that victorious Christian life, to live as the way that, that we would desire to live as Christians. That word mighty is the same word in Philippians 4.13, which most of us know by, by heart. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. The same word, who is mighty in me. That power, that might of Christ makes it such that we can be victorious in our Christian life and live our life as God wants us to. Now, back to 2 Corinthians 10.4. Am I moving too fast? 
You keeping up with me so far? This is just the introduction. That's why I've been rushing through it real fast. We come back to this. We realize this battle between the flesh and, and, and the spirit. That's what all of us face there. Now, it is mighty in verse 4. God working through us, we are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. What are strongholds? Are we facing any strongholds? Now, literally, the word stronghold is that of a bulwark. These, uh, uh, th these strong walls, towers, where they've got just very small openings and, and heavy stone in front and everything else. Back in the old times, just a few men could hold off a whole army if they had that kind of a bulwark that they were behind. It was safe. It was secure. Nothing could touch us. You say, well, what's that have to do here with verse 4, casting down, pulling down strongholds? Well, what are the strongholds we're talking about? What is so defensed and so hard to combat as far as our enemy is concerned? And we would begin to think about Satan himself and persecution and all that. But really in the context, look at verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What are these strongholds? Our thoughts. This stronghold are those habits that we find that are so hard to break. You see, the battle really is in the mind. Now, these strongholds, what are these strongholds? Well, what I'm really picturing in my mind here is all these old habits that we had in the world. That's the flesh. That's what we had. Now that we're a Christian, we want to break those old strongholds so we can live a new victorious life. I mean, some of these addictions are really, really hard. I've worked with a lot of people that struggle. I mean, alcoholism is one of those things that just keeps coming back and back and back. And you think you got the, the victory over it, and it just keeps coming back. And many times, you know, drugs and all that kind of stuff, anger. Anger is a bad, bad habit. You know, pornography, all those kind of things. Man, those things can really be powerful. And uh, many of us, you know, raised in more of an innocent age, perhaps didn't face a lot of that. But a lot of the people I know today that come to know Christ, man, they're really struggling. And even all of us, I think, when it comes to anger and all the other habits that we have, the, the way we defend ourselves and, and, and all of that, we want to get rid of that. And we battle and we battle and we battle. Well, what's the answer? Well, verse 4 tells us if we're in the flesh, we're going to lose every time. You know, we can't battle anger by saying, I'm not going to get angry. You know, I am not going to get angry. I am not going to get angry. It doesn't work that way. You can't, you can't fight the flesh with the flesh. But mighty through God, oh, the victory is there. Tearing down these strongholds, having the victory in Christ. When we depend upon him and we operate in the power of his strength. Now go into verse 5, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations imaginations, not just daydreaming necessarily, but more the idea of, of, uh, of logic, the idea of imaginations or, or reasonings. Uh, the Greek word is literally, literally uh, logismo, which when we get logic or logistics, that's where the word comes from. Casting down all of our logistics. Man, we have, we have the ability to think we can do anything and everything, don't we? We plan it all out. But the problem is here, if you read the rest of verse 5, it's not just that we're logical. That's not the point. The point is that we're leaving God out because it is combined with every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And the word high thing that, that exalts itself is this whole idea of being self-sufficient. I don't need God. Now, folks, we're living in a world that says, I don't need God. I mean, Christianity has is, is been put in that closet nowadays. You, you have a hard time talking about Christ on a college campus without being in trouble or wherever it may be. The public discourse has almost left God completely out. And our minds are saturated with this whole thing of that which leaves God out. The sciences, so much built upon the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution is nothing but a vain attempt 
to explain creation without a creator. And when I say a vain attempt, they haven't succeeded. You know, I was thinking the other day, I'm not aware of any advance in science that has ever been supported by evolution. As far as in some advance in medicine or whatever it might be, no. I mean, science is a beautiful study about God's creation. But evolution says, oh, we don't need God. You know, we can make ourselves. And all you need to make yourself is just a few more millions or billions of years. You know, just add in time and anything's possible. How ridiculous. But you see, that's that imagination. That's that high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Secular, uh, secular psychology, the same way, just leaves God out. You know, basically, secular psychology, Freud was built heavily upon evolution, upon, uh, upon the whole theory of evolution. And the idea that we're just animals, we can take care of our own problem, we can solve our own problems, we don't need God. Now, this high thing that exalts itself against the nature of God, contrary to God, leaving God out. We live in a world today that is so sophisticated. They really think they're smart. I mean, so many with their education and their vocabulary, and they look down their nose at these poor, simple, Bible-believing Christians. You know, we don't know anything, but they will not engage in debate. No, they just ridicule and all of that. You know, they, they treat us as if we don't have a clue what's going on. How well have they done? How well has secular philosophy, psychology, evolution, how, how well has that done to... to curb the ills of mankind? Have we brought peace to the earth? Is this a more peaceful world today? Are our schools safer today than they were a generation or two back? Uh, are the neighborhoods safer today? I mean, how well is everybody doing with morality? Uh, people love each other more today than they used to, is that right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious the secular thinking isn't solving the problems. They're leaving God out. I mean, they're not a happy bunch. The whole LGBTQIA bunch, they're not happier. They leave God out. Technology, oh my, social media and technology, we're going to really cure our ills, aren't we? These are nothing more than headlines that I got right off of the, the internet, okay? Just type in about uh, social media and all of that. Here's one quote. These are all secular articles. And they're out of, uh, out of uh, even psych psychology journals and all of that. Here's a quote. Technology was supposed to connect us, but we're more disconnected than ever. Here's another one. Being together while not being together. That kind of describes what's going on today. Uh, here's another one. As we expect more from technology, do we expect less from others? You know, it's not, it's not bringing us together better. Uh, here's another quote from a, a psychology uh, journal. These devices don't just change what we do, but what we are. That's kind of threatening, kind of scary. And th there's so much there about all this technology and social media and all of that. Is this a better world? Folks, when we leave God out, I mean, go back to verse 5 again, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. When you leave God out, we have no purpose in life. If we're not responsible to a creator, there is no morality. Our world is not moral today. When you leave God out... What's left? And yet, so many of us, so many of us just go right along with the world. We're in a battle and we don't even know it. I mean, verse 3 says, man, we don't war after the flesh. We are in a battle. We're in a war. We're, we're, we're being challenged continually to ignore the things of the Word of God and to ignore Him and to just go along with the flow and everything that's around us. Look at Romans 12 and verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. He says there, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Now, how are we transformed? By the renewing of your mind. Folks, the battle's up here. 
We're in a battle, a battle against the flesh and against the spirit. And you say, well, it's a heart battle. Yes, it is. And the mind and the heart, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That, that connection there, our thoughts lead us one way or another. Have we become conformed to this world? Do we think the way the world thinks? Do we want the things the world offers? Do we lust after, desire to have those kind of things that everybody else has? Do we laugh at the things the world laughs at? Uh, do we desire the world's music and movies and fashions and morality? You say, well, hey, you can't, you know, you, you got to live in the world. Yes, we live in a world. But folks, we don't war after the flesh. We live in the fleshly world. But we have to realize there's a battle for our minds. And so many, so many Christians have just ignored the battle. They've allowed that fleshly world to just penetrate our thoughts so that we're, we're totally absorbed in these things here. Now, the victory, the victory is found in Christ. And it is a war that you and I have to acknowledge. If we don't see it as a war, Satan's won already. The flesh is going to win. We have to realize we're in a battle. It's a consistent battle. I want you to look at verse 5 again, and I'm going to get a little technical here, but on purpose. Casting down imaginations. Casting down is a present active participle. Present means continually. It's not a one-time battle. And you go on down in verse 5, and it says, bringing into captivity. Once again, a present active participle. The idea of, of continually battling, continually bringing into captivity. So many of us will fight the battle, and then we just, oh, I won that, and so we kind of quit, and guess what happens? Satan never gives up. He's continually there. He's always there trying to, 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 to catch our thoughts and bring us down. Go back to chapter 2 and verse 11. We talk about Satan and his involvement. Satan is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at once, but he's in league with the world, the world system that's anti-God that we've been talking about, and in league with our flesh, the old nature. And so... We need to be, be very much aware that Satan is very active to destroy the work of God in us and our ability to serve him and, and be a witness to others, and he uses our flesh as well. Uh, back in chapter 2, there in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We've got to be sharp. His devices. How does he operate? If we don't know our enemy, we're pretty vulnerable, aren't we? We need to know what we're up against. And Satan and his devices, he is continually trying to find ways to catch us off guard and, and, and to get our thoughts off of him and, and our thoughts off of the things that, that we ought to be thinking about and being dragged back down into those imaginations and, and uh, those strongholds, those old habits and those old thoughts. The interesting thing there in verse 5, when it says bringing into captivity every thought, the end of verse 5, to the obedience of Christ. Do you realize the word thought translated here is the exact same word that we read about devices in 2.11? We're not ignorant of Satan's devices, the way he thinks. Now, the word thought here is something that I really want to take a moment to explain. In, in, in the end of verse 5 there, bringing into captivity, captive, uh, winning that battle against uh, taking these thoughts and, and putting them in the dungeon. I mean, we're going to take captive of all of these thoughts. These thoughts are not the ability to think. These thoughts are not those perceptions that we get. They're, they're not just understanding things. I mean, thoughts come and go all the time, don't they? And there are many, many different words. There's, there's about a dozen different Greek words that can be translated thoughts. This particular word that's translated thought here is this whole idea of to reason and to take a thought to calculate, to, to work on it, to, to spend time on it, to, to manipulate it. We all get thoughts. I mean, stupid thoughts come and, man, just they're stupid. You just discard them. You don't take the time to even think about them. 
I know sometimes young people have a tendency to punish themselves because, oh, I get this thought, and they have the idea, if I get this thought, then, man, I'm, there's re something really bad about me. No, no, thoughts are going to come all the time. I mean, you see advertisements and posters and, and, and just all the kind of thoughts that come our way. Where do these thoughts come from? I don't know. I've had some pretty dumb dreams at night, and I wake up trying to solve those dreams. Where did they come from? I don't know. If they're stupid, dismiss them. However, this word is saying, don't allow those thoughts then to become the basis for your activity. You're taking and working those thoughts. You're, you're calculating. You're, you're trying to, to make them work out in some way to satisfy the old nature. And that is what we want to bring captive. We want to submit it to him. Now, how do we conquer those thoughts? Well, number one, the key is there in verse 5 of obedience, bringing every thought into obedience. My first thought is, who's in control? Paul says, what, don't you know that your body is not your own? I mean, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not your own. You were bought with a price. We need to stop and realize. We need to calculate. We need to reason. You know, our reasonable service is that our life is not ours. It belongs to him. And therefore, we have a stewardship. We can't be careless in these areas. We need to bring every thought in every area, because he says there, uh, every thought to the obedience of Christ, to doing that which, and thinking that which we know is right and proper. Uh, Philippians 2.5 makes it pretty simple. You know, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Just simply having the mind of Christ. Now, we're not going to have the mind of Christ if we're not in the word of God. The mind of Christ. How did Christ think? Remember when the, the, the rage was, uh, what would Jesus do? W-W-J-D, is that what it was? You know, bracelets and everything else. Hey, if you're not in your Bible, you don't have a clue what Jesus would do. I mean, how did Jesus think? How did he operate? As you spend time in the Word of God, then it's going to refresh. It's going to renew the mind. And there's so much in Scripture. I'm not going to take time because of, of the hour, but in Ephesians 4, putting off the old man, putting on the new man by the renewing of your mind. We've got to have a mind that is refreshed daily with the Word of God so that our mind is on Him. We need to guard our mind. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. This is what we had for our Scripture reading this morning. 1 uh, Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 13 again. He says there, uh, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, to gird up the, the, the loins of your mind, the loin is, is this part of our body, the abdomen. And the abdomen is very, very uh, vulnerable. Uh, have you seen these heavy weight lifters? These little super, super guys that are just lifting hundreds and hundreds of pounds? They put on a girdle. Why do they put on that girdle, that belt? To protect their loins. You see, everything we do is we lift our arms, it's these muscles right here. If we lift our legs, it's these muscles right here. You bend over, you straighten up, you lift. Everything you do involves the muscles of your, of your loins. So in that picture that he's given us here in, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 13, is the loins of our mind, the place where we're the most vulnerable, Whatever that may be, we need to gird it up. We need to put that belt around it so that we don't pop that muscle and have that hernia. We need to protect our mind. And I think when it says gird up the loins of your mind, that, that it may be a little different for each one of us. What's the area that Satan can use to tempt us? What's the area the world uses to tempt us? We need to protect that, avoid that, do everything that we can so that our mind will be stayed on Christ. The renewing of our mind is so, so important. And then Philippians chapter 4. Not only do we stay in the Word of God, but then all day long our thoughts ought to be this way. Philippians chapter 4. Take a look, if you would, please, at verse 8. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, now, that's, this is a criteria. He's going to say at the end of verse 8, think on these things. Is it true? We need to challenge our thoughts. I mean, if it's stupid, just get rid of it. If it's not true, then, then don't bother the time. 
You know, it's got to be true, true as we know through the word of God. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, with justice, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Folks, even though these individual words may not communicate a whole lot, I think everyone here knows what these, what these words are saying. You know, we know when we're off track. We know when this is not good. We know when we're going the wrong direction. This is not healthy. This is not right. And some of us are more vulnerable in one area than another, and we need to protect, gird up the loins of our mind. The battle is in the mind. We need to be in control of our own mind. Think on these things. And what's the benefit? Verse 9, this is Philippians 4, verse 9. Those things which we have heard, which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do be obedient, and the God of peace shall be with you. The victory is there. He's promised the victory. The victory over the strongholds, those old habits. Victory over all of these thoughts that we get. We, we, we get led down this, this road or that road. The victory is in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's promised that to us. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, a very special verse. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, the promise of God to each and every one of us. I had 1 Timothy, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7. For God hath not given to us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of what kind of a mind? A sound mind. You know, God has promised that he'll give us that sound mind. All we've got to do is just put him first. Stay in the word of God. Discipline our minds so that we're obedient to think on the things that we ought to think. We ought to have that confidence. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 ends with this kind of a confidence. Verse 57, but thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how we begin every day. You know, as we focus on the word of God, as we commit that day to him, it ought to be thanksgiving because of the power of Christ, the victory that he's given us. We don't have to go along with the world. I mean, logically, the world has nothing to offer. The philosophy of the world that leaves God out. You know, they're going down a, a dark road. It's, it's not good. God's given us that ability to be the light in a dark place. We need to be thankful that he gives us the victory. We have, we have him. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Therefore, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. A confident mind that stayed on Christ that has the peace of God, man, that is worth more than anything else. God gives that to us if we just let him. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. It's all by the grace of God. I thank you, dear Lord, that you've given us the mind that you gave us. You created us with such ability, but you gave us that stewardship to use our mind to serve and honor you. Lord, help us to be wise to protect our mind from those things that would drag us down. Help us, dear Lord, to be thankful that we have the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ over all of these old habits or whatever it may be. Help us, dear Lord, to live that kind of a, of a confident, abounding life, abounding in the work of the Lord, the joy of sharing Christ with others. Use us, dear Lord, to honor and glorify you and to make a difference in other people's lives. Help us to be a light in this dark world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you would please take your hymn books now and turn with me to hymn number 461. 461. The secret really is just being in Christ. I mean, it's not a secret as much as it is just a simplicity of, of staying close to him and staying with him. Now, we haven't talked about being saved. We talked about it. Yes, we did. That new creature in Christ. But we haven't shared how to be saved. If you're here this morning and you don't know what it means to be a Christian, I mean, you called yourself a Christian, but you don't have that, that spirit of God in your heart and life, the victory that we've been talking about, we love to share with you from God's word how to be saved. 
fact is, in just a few minutes, I mean, if step forward during the service, we'll pair you up with a counselor that can show you how to understand what the Bible says about being saved. It's a very simple message. Be able to pray with you, give you that victory in Christ. Now, as a Christian, if we can pray with you, if we can encourage, come alongside, help in any way, please give us that opportunity. I'll be down front, just let me know. Pair you up with a friend or you can pray alone, whatever it may be but we want to help and encourage in any way that we can. Let's stand together, please, on that very first stanza, hymn number 461. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord.